Just to think of uh, regulation, which we've heard a certain amount about in a number of the different trends, I guess the classic model in many countries was there would be a banking regulator, a securities regulator, an insurance regulator, and probably a pensions regulator. But did that system work or that system didn't fundamentally work? Or is it going to be a whole lot better going to the so-called uh, Twin Peak system, where there's one regulator regulates all the financial institutions in terms of licensing and solvency of the institution, and another regulator regulates the products that these institutions provide or make available or sell to the public. So any views from US or from Germany or Singapore as to? Well, I mean, in the United States, I think we've taken the position, at least, that we don't depend on the regulators solely for compliance enforcement. And you go back to our Civil War in the 1865, when we passed the civil rights statutes after the Civil War, we've vested authority in the United States government to enforce the statutes, but we also vested authority in citizens to bring suits in the name of the United States to the extent that they were injured. And that is the essence of our securities litigation under, under 10B. And it's, uh, we do that through derivative litigation on behalf of shareholders. And we've gone even so far, actually, starting with the Civil War and the False Claims Act, to now pay bounties and pay bounties under the Dodd-Frank statute. So I guess I want to make a separate point, is, is that I think, first, you can't depend solely on the regulators. No matter how you sort of organize the regulators, you can't. You have to have an independent compliance enforcement system has to be transparency to that, the first thing. And the second thing, I think, Alex said, is, is the issue, do you want to go to jail or do you want your car back? And I think you kind of want both. Because if the offender says all, the worst case scenario is if I am caught stealing 1,000 cars, that one person may catch me and I may have to give a car back, then he will game the system and say, I will take the risk and effectively what happens is you can calculate the cost of a license to break the law. And in the United States, we don't play too much soccer, but we do know, understand that, you know, if somebody's going to score a goal, you push them because the worst case is you get a yellow card, right? And so in effect, and, you know, breaking the rules have become part of the game and you have to make it so, you have to have a system so that doesn't happen, right? And it has to be transparent, which actually leads me to couple of questions, which I was just dying to ask you, <laughs> which is that I think I heard you say that at the end of the day, uh, the, the name of the defendant in the arbitration is not a matter of public record, right? Yes. And, and so do you see that as a problem with regard to transparency and compliance enforcement, right? If, for example, there is a common scheme and there's a hundred victims who may come forward to you in arbitration, right? You say, I had this terrific uh, visit with you last night. You said, I think you had 16 people come so, come so far. But if more people knew that a, a particular problem was occurring and it was a matter of transparency and the defendant was public, would more people come forward? And do you see that as something you want to change? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. It's the question about, you know, where do you strike the balance you know, between what we do um, and public information to it? Um, we have to go back one step about you know, what um, FDRC is meant to do. So in the process of setting up the Financial Dispute Resolution Center in Hong Kong in FDRC, um, it was made very clear that FDRC would not be an ombudsman uh, system. See, Taiwan, the uh, United Kingdom, Australia, it's an um, is a financial ombudsman system whereby the organization has the right to investigate, right, a complaint, and therefore can make a decision on who is right and who is wrong. The policymakers in Hong Kong decided to go for a non-ombudsman system. So we are set up without statutory powers, without the powers to investigate a case, and without powers to say <coughs> who is right and who is wrong. And therefore, we have a very different model from that used in many different countries. Hence, what we do is the provision of alternative financial dispute resolution processes beyond the court system. So in Hong Kong, our court system is very highly regarded 
it's very independent, it's very robust, and we have you know, very trusting, I mean, trustworthy judges. So, but then it can be quite an expensive and quite a prolonged process if you decide to go to the court system. Hence, what FDRC provides is an alternative to that that's more efficient, that's probably faster, probably a lot cheaper. So that's what we do. You know, we, we, we do not decide who is right or who is wrong. So our main emphasis is actually on the mediation process. We spend most of our energies and time on the mediation process. So for the mediation process, the mediator is impartial and the mediator does not give advice and the mediator does not make a decision as to who is right and who is wrong. It's for the parties to decide for themselves what settlement they can come to and live with. That's basically it. So it's, in a way, it's the confidential process that comes under the mediation ordinance of Hong Kong. Right. It's only when the mediation is not successful, the claimant then has the right to choose whether to take the next step, to go to arbitration or go to court. That's up to the claimant. But remember, it's not a right under our rules for the financial institution to take that step. There's no choice on, on behalf of the financial institution because this is a consumer oriented service. Mm -hmm. So if the um, claimant decides to go for arbitration, when you have an arbitral award, that arbitral award is under our terms of reference and our guidelines, is confidential to the parties. Hence, we are not publishing it. That's under the rules that we are given. Not that the rules are fixed in stone, right? But we have to monitor our cases and see whether there is a need to strike the balance in another way. So right now, what we want to do is to not to name and shame, right? We're not going to identify um, this arbitral award was given against this bank for this product. We're not you know, there yet. What we are trying to do is to use the information about what happened at the mis-selling or whatever and feed it back to our members, that's all the banks and the financial institutions, and say, maybe if you look at the trend, maybe in when you're selling insurance products, for example, you have probably to have better trained, better informed advices mm -hmm. so that the mis-selling doesn't happen. You know? So that's what we're trying to do, is to, is to you know, feed back that sort of case scenario without the naming and shaming. See, in, in the United States, securities lawyers like myself have this uh, perspective, which is that corporations are run by temporary caretakers. And when we passed Dodd-Frank, we had a big, big uh, dispute over the role of internal compliance with regard to whistleblowers. Why should you have whistleblowers? Shouldn't you just have internal compliance solve the problem? And um, you know, we, we looked at uh, Jeffrey Skilling and Enron and WorldCom and Bernie Ebers, and what we realized is that temporary caretakers are motivated by their own economic needs, which are not necessarily consistent with the needs of the shareholders. So if you let the corporation solve the problem, it, it, may, it may or may not get solved, which sort of you know, makes me think of like from, I, I hate to, because I, I have all these questions. This is like a learning experience for me as well. So I just want to ask Alex, I mean, is that something, a perspective you, you share? And also, like, I was just wondering, what are the obstacles to bringing suits on, with regard to these issues outside the US? Yeah, um, first, just quickly, you know, permit me to you, Sue. I think it's a great temporary way of dealing with mis-selling products to have your system in place, have the uh, FDRC in place. I think if class actions are permitted, you know, it's more a temporary thing because then consumers have, have access to class actions to deal with that. Because right now, it is, you know, for those people who don't have access to class actions, who don't have access to the money and the ability to actually pursue some of the big institutions um, in court. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you have a temporary life. I'm just saying it is, it seems it is a good bridging mechanism. And, but I think it could graduate to a higher level, uh, maybe have a second step arbitration for over 500,000 and you hook up with one of the big international arbitration institutions. Mm -hmm. but, I'm getting off the subject, I'm sorry. The, uh, and I'm getting off your question, but I've, I'm also excited about this and I've been doing this a long time and you know, when I get the chance to interact here, so I have all those questions or comments too. Um, 
the questions that Ruben asked, the biggest obstacles to effective investor protection outside the class action system in the US where everybody can go and sue how small or big they are, and even if they don't sue, somebody else does the job for you. You sue and you protect him. You sit at home, let him fight for you. Very nice, very convenient. You don't have to pay anything, you don't have to spend time, and he's fighting for you. That's a nice system, it works well. Now, another aspect of what you said before, securities fraud pays. How does it pay? Well, it pays because if you as a company issue stock or bonds and you lie to the investors, and out of a billion or two billion dollar fraud, you have to pay a tenth back, it pays. Which criminal has to go into a store and rob a hundred dollars and when he gets caught gives only back ten? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. But so securities fraud pays. The only deterrence is criminal enforcement. But when you look at the vast majority of class actions that are being filed, there's probably only 10% of class actions that are filed where there is also a criminal prosecution at the same time. So 90% of the cases that get filed settle to 70%, which means there's a large, there's some overlap of cases that are just not good and shouldn't have been filed, but there's also a large amount of cases where there's no criminal enforcement and the cases are successful and investors get money back, but only a small percentage of what the real damage that was caused. So I encourage all of you, go commit securities fraud, it really pays. <laughs> I, I just say, uh, Alex, in the, age, in the age of the internet, some blogger is going to okay, say in I about 15 money. minutes, Alexander Roy said security fraud pays, and that's the takeaway. <laughs> yeah. So oh, just no, for no, the record, I hope that's not your point. Hold on for a second, please. So <laughs> the second thing is, if you're a CFA, don't give any advice, because if you give advice, you can be liable. If you don't give any advice, you just sell products, you didn't, give an, uh, you didn't give an opinion, you can't be liable for that. Yeah. But uh, let him speak and then I get back to actually the answer to your question. This panel's very interesting. There's two <laughs> lawyers and there's two actuaries and I don't think we're going to agree. <laughs> <laughs> Can Leanne? Uh, well, the uh, dispute system in Hong Kong uh, follow very much what happened in Singapore. And uh, from the uh, investor's point of view, uh, the ordinary consumer's point of view, the system is not working. Well, but I know uh, Su Chiam uh, intends to do something a bit different. But generally, if you follow the Singapore model, it's not doing well. We can talk about more about that later on. But the question that, uh, okay, about class action, apart from class action in America, they have a system called contingency fee, uh, which is very important. Uh, we don't have people like Anthony Neo who do it pro bono, senior counsel. Uh, and uh, we do need uh, the system of contingency to follow. But to answer your question earlier on, you said, uh, should we have the twin peak system uh, in Australia? And I strongly endorse that uh, because uh, you've, I've seen uh, regulators that have the both role and they don't know uh, which role to perform. They want to make sure the financial institutions are safe and they also uh, neglect, therefore, the uh, consumer protection. It's better for this to be separate. And furthermore, uh, if you have a separate consumer protection uh, uh, agency, uh, they should be performing the role of taking up action on behalf of retail investors to sue the banks, yeah. which is what you see in America. The Attorney General's office take up that role. It doesn't happen in Singapore. I think Hong Kong is a bit more active than Singapore. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also quite important. Well, it's, it's very interesting to look at all the different jurisdictions. And I think we're going to see more and more cross-jurisdictional uh, complications, for example, between Hong Kong and China. And in fact, what's occurring to me is that a few years ago, there was a, a magnificent example of mis-selling. This was, um, in, in Hong Kong, there's a medical insurer called Blue Cross. Nothing to do with US Blue Cross, they just stole the name. But then a little company got set up in Heilongjiang, <coughs> in northern China, which also called it blue, blue, itself Blue Cross. And it said, fill up the form here in Heilongjiang, pay your money here in Heilongjiang, and if there's any medical claims, send them to Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> so that one had to be stopped. 
Um, now, we've got many, many interesting questions. Um, Alex, one quick word and then let's, let, let's yeah. dig into the questions. So, <laughs> you hit on one very important point, the contingency fees. It is not just lack of class actions outside the United States or Canada that is a problem for effective investor protection for the small man or woman. Um, it, is, uh, it is the fee system. I have a quick you know, even if you have a class action, but you have to pay for the lawyers and for the experts in a complicated case against a big defendant, a big company, how are you going to finance it? So contingency fees where lawyers are funding it for a success at the end are very important. So it's the procedural model of a class action. If it doesn't exist, um, you know, you also have to be able to put a group together, a group of people, and you need to be able to um, to finance that, and so there's model finance models or funding models, and that's how it exists in Australia. Australia has an opt-out class action which one can sue on behalf of everybody, but it doesn't work because of the financial aspects of the funding of, of the success fee, which are not allowed in Australia. The third thing is costs of the court, where you have to pay a high filing cost. That's also something. It's a financial aspect of the litigation, and then the adverse party costs. If you have adverse party cost risk in England, how are you going to sue a big bank like uh, RBS or whatever who, uh, who lied to the market? How are you going to sue them when you face 10, 15, 20 million pounds in adverse party costs, but you only lost 100,000? That doesn't seem like a good business to go into, even if you were able to pay your lawyers. So it's a combination of all of that, the lack of the procedural system to group people together in a class, yes. um, the lack of success fees, and, a lack of, and, and the court fees and adverse party cost risks. All of that create different models in different countries, and I can go into 200 countries now, but I'll spare you with it. Well, that's, and that's why, I just call you, that's, that's why United States is such an attractive forum for a lot of international investors, for a couple of reasons. One is we have the American rule, uh, a loser does not pay, so you don't have to spend the money to take out the insurance as you would if you were bringing a case in, in the UK. And the second and critically important point is uh, these cases are uh, very labor, labor intensive in terms of document review, hundreds, you know, millions and millions of documents. And uh, the cost to analyze the documents, the expert cost, the statistical experts, the forensic accountants, uh, all of that in the United States, all those costs, those advanced costs, are borne by the lawyers. And as a, as a practical matter, the plaintiff does not require to put out any money and need not pay those costs if he loses. So you've got a very, very uh, economically efficient system for investors who, who, uh, who, who don't want to take the risk of uh, putting out money to recover, when in fact it may be that they're only going to get some portion of their return back. Uh, just, uh, just one statement about these two <laughs> lawyers. Uh, well, I was involved in organizing the class action on the pinnacle notes with an American lawyer uh, in America. So I, I become very familiar with what you are saying, and I would endorse uh, the lawyer's uh, version of why we should have class action with success fee. Now, if anybody's blogging, that's exactly what to pick up. So, <laughs> Jim, you're... Yeah, that's very quickly. Kind of, yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, security fraud does not pay. <laughs> and basically, you know, at the end of the day, um, Mark Stewart, who is now in the SFC, you know, he is very keen on, you know, making sure that you go to jail if you're caught. Um, I spent eight years in the Hong Kong Attorney General's chambers in the Commercial Crimes Unit. Um, and I prosecuted insider dealing and different types <coughs> of um, in, insider fraud. The point is, um, when we were doing that in the 80s, in those days, it was not truly criminal. It was sort of civil, quasi-criminal. So not so much go to jail. And I think in the last um, 20, 30 years, the shift towards go to jail and not looking lightly at what they call victimless crimes like insider dealing, the whole you know, culture has changed. It's a lot more, if you do that, um, you know, um, it's security fraud, you are likely to go to jail. So I, I think the whole culture has shifted. Um, that, that's one point. 
Secondly, it's about FIDREC. Um, I was very um, lucky last year to be invited by the Singapore judiciary to go to Singapore to talk to them about the mediation ordinance that I helped draft in Hong Kong and to share with them this law that we have. One of the highlights was that I was um, um, allowed to go visit FIDREC. And uh, comparing FIDREC uh, with FDRC, I think it's quite different, um, having talked to them and gone through the system. What FIDREC does is that it actually has an adjudication system. So in adjudication, it's, it's more like a court. In that sense, you have an adjudicator and the person, in fact, their setting is very much like a court. You know, you say your piece, you say your piece, it's quite legalistic. Adjudicator makes a decision. The decision does say who is right and who is wrong. And what it is is that usually in banks, when they sell the products, they get the uh, consumer to sign this uh, disclaimer form. I understand what I'm buying and therefore I'll not bring suit against you. So if that's the case, you always sort of more chances of losing because you're supposed to have signed up with your eyes open, right? Mm -hmm. What is different in Hong Kong is that, as I explained earlier, we don't have adjudication in FDRC. We don't say who is right or who is wrong. We basically try to get both parties in the mediation to resolve the dispute themselves, with whatever they have. Of course, when the mediation is not successful and people go to arbitration, that's when it's harder. Because usually the financial institution has a big legal backup, you know, legal uh, department, whereas the claimant is quite a bit lost sometimes, you know, because arbitration is more legalistic. So a lot of times we, we recommend to the claimant to first consider going to get legal advice. We do not, um, you know, sort of give legal advice at all. We don't. But we do encourage claimants to first, you know, think about their case legally and if, if required, get legal advice. If they can't afford legal advice, you know, we might recommend them to go and check out with the Law Society free legal advice service or some NGOs who might be able to advise them. Thank you. Good, 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 good. Let's move on to the questions here. We have some fascinating questions. I'm quite certain we're going to run out of time. This one says, in today's news, two local professional investment advisors had their private conversation leaked and they were very, very bearish on prospects for A shares and the China, Shanghai markets and so on. Publicly, they had been saying just the opposite. Now, is this unethical, is this actionable, or is this reality? It's It is part of the evidence when, you want, when somebody has acted upon their official advice, not their unofficial opinion. I, I would imagine that if somebody bought based upon their official opinion and it is contrary to what they say in private and then something goes wrong with the product, you have very good evidence. But is that a prove. thing, I mean, that, that I think can apply to a single share. I mean, if I say buy the share and then privately I say, you know, this share is laps up, rubbish, um, that's no good. But I mean, if it applies to a market as a whole, can you really hang well, on to a whole stock market? I, w I would think so. It all becomes in a part of your disclosure duty in your proper, you know, proper education of your client too. If your client buys a single security in a market that you don't believe in, I think you have a duty to disclose it to the client too and, and make at least have, have a disclaimer in there and say, so, you know what, maybe this company could be good but I don't believe in the overall market. If that's what you know and what you believe in, I believe that's what you should tell your client too. If you don't and you don't have a sophisticated client, my understanding of fairness and justice is, you misled the client. So. There's, I think there's two issues. One is the question of the confidentiality of information. And an interesting note is in the Dodd-Frank whistleblower regulations, um, employees sign all kinds of confidentiality requirements saying, you know, uh, you can be sued if you release this information. In fact, Dodd-Frank regulations specifically say, those are void as to reports to the regulatory authority. The SEC does not recognize them. So that particular conversation certainly could go to the SEC. The second question is, what's the value of the evidence? Because I would say that in a regulatory sense, it, evidence comes in, what's the value of the evidence? Is it systemic? Does it, does it show, is it evidence of system, systemic behavior? Is it pervasive? And this is, this is a question of collection of evidence and doing interviews. We're actually, um, Saturday I'm starting doing a training session at Keisha Demery Law School and we're training, training uh, financial fraud prosecutors for the Shanghai uh, Prosecutor's Office on how to actually interview witnesses. And uh, 
And uh, this, is, this is the big question and how to put these cases together. It's very, very complicated. You have to gather the facts. You cannot, uh, you cannot collect uh, conclusions. And one of the interesting challenges in terms of cross-border enforcement is the collection of core factual, as Aristotle would say, core factual information that can be used, used, in, used in court. So that's the question, is, is this evidence of pervasive behavior and what more would you have to do to collect core facts to prove it? Okay, thank you. Question here for uh, Suchan. Um, how do you ensure that the financial institution who has gone through mediation for a specific matter would not repeat what it has done to result in the mediation dispute um, in the first place? Yeah, I have no control over what the financial institution will do, uh, whether it will repeat itself or not. I think it needs to do its own risk assessment because it does cost the financial institution if they keep repeating problems, yeah. right? I think they would need to learn from, um, from the complaints coming in. But you won't report at the end of the year to say this bank had 10 ah. arbitrations or 15 arbitrations, I mean, you won't? Well, what it is like is that, that um, um, there is some sort of scoreboard. As part of our terms of reference for FDRC, the uh, two regulators, i.e. the SFC and HKMA, um, they, they have the right to know, um, you know all the different um, um, mediation agreement. So, so before, you're like a whistleblower? In a way, we are not really more like a canary, you know, f you know, for the coal mines. That really, um, we, we we are supposed to also track systemic issues and gross misconduct. We do have a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, signed between the FDRC and the SFC and HKMA in Hong Kong. So, if you need to access that, it's on our website. It very clearly spells out what we have to do in terms of our reporting to SFC and HKMA, and what they do. So what it is is that uh, it's very clear delineation. Mm -hmm. We are not regulators. It's not our job to report on anyone. You know, the regulators have their own powers. If they need to have evidence, or whatever, um, you know, they can choose to do what they want to do in terms of their enforcement abilities. We are purely a dispute resolution process provider. Thank you. Okay, here's a next interesting one. Can the panel make some comments on the potential liability of bank and other executives on inheriting issues from previous management? Is there a time limit on banks and others being responsible for historic misdemeanors? I, I think, I mean, statute of limitations are, regular, uh, are matters of local law. Um, that's one thing. And a statute of limitation re re regulates how long a civil or a criminal suit can be brought for a certain misbehavior. When you talk about an institution like a bank or anybody else, um, that institution is responsible, responsible for what their management does. That's a respondeat superior theory uh, where there's institutional liability for that. So it doesn't matter whether management is there or not anymore in most situations. It's if you go in against the company, the company cannot act as a person. It acts through its organs, uh, or we call them organs, I mean, through, through authorized persons. So I would think there's no issue. But one of the problems, it seems to me, when we see the fines that all the banks are paying for LIBOR or whatever else, um, is basically if you have to five, pay out you know, 500 million US dollars, that uh, affects the shareholders, that affects the value of the company. But surely you shouldn't penalize the shareholders, surely the executives who have done bad, who have done wrong here, are they not the ones who should be punished, banned for life, go to jail, fined, etc., etc.? So how, how do we overcome that? Well, a couple of things. In the, uh, in, in the, in the Pfizer situation, uh, where Pfizer uh, produced these COX-2 inhibitors, these products that were uh, defective, and the share price dropped, we're actually counsel in the securities litigation, but after that happened, uh, a lawsuit was brought against the directors of the corporation for breaching their, breaching their fiduciary duty. So where there actually are fines that are imposed on the corporation because the corporation's engaged in unlawful conduct, you can hold the directors liable. Now in the United States, we have a concept called, everywhere else, ultra-virus. And if you look at a basic charter uh, for Articles of Incorporation for Delaware Corporation, it will say that you are permitted to engage in anything that's lawful. And so when an officer or a director allows the corporation, knowingly allows them to engage in uh, unlawful behavior, they're, they're breaching their fiduciary duty. And just 
quickly. The thing that actually fascinates me, because I really love this discussion, is that when you talk about unlawful behavior, it's not only on the question of what's unlawful domestically, it's what's unlawful wherever they're engaging in uh, conduct. So just quickly, we're suing, for example, the uh, directors of the Hershey Company. They make chocolate, probably not the best chocolate in the world, but nonetheless chocolate. And uh, Hershey uh, gets their uh, cocoa beans from the Ivory Coast, and everybody knows that in the Ivory Coast, most of the cocoa beans are harvested with child labor. Well, it turns out in the Ivory Coast, that's unlawful. And so Hershey is permitting, right, uh, permitting uh, the u engaging in aiding and abetting unlawful conduct. And therefore, and, and the question is, what's the, what's the exposure, the responsibility of the directors? Now, going back to your original question is, everybody in the United States says it wouldn't be my responsibility, I didn't know. We call that inside the beltway in the United States plausible deniability, right? Like the Nixon <laughs> White House, right? It was somebody else who did the break-in, right? And so in the United States, we substitute actual knowledge, right, for reckless disregard. So if you're buying a corporation, you know that there's problems. You're, you know, you're, you're buying a bank and you know the bank hasn't recorded properly or transferred their mortgages, and you knowingly fail to do the right due diligence, then you can show intent or knowledge through reckless dis disregard. But these are, it's a whole fascinating area of law and it brings into a question and not only this issue that I was raising about what my laws are in the United States, but it's also what is the laws wherever you're transacting business. Right, yes. But, but you know, your question is on, on shareholders, who it's a typical question we get, I'm, so, I'm still a holder of securities, I'm suing myself, right? And where does the money come from when I'm suing myself? <laughs> Usually, whether, you know, LIBOR, for example, you know, or, or other, it, doesn't, it really does not matter. Usually you have directors you can go after for a limited amount, but you have directors and officers liability insurance that covers a lot of the misbehavior, so that's where pockets where money's come from. Third, when you file a lawsuit, usually the stock price does not drop anymore. The stock price drops when there is negative information that's coming out. And if you sue three months later, normally the stock price does not drop. That, that is sort of built in already. That civil liability is usually built in already at a time when the market reacts to disclosure of information that was previously not given to the market. And so the market was not able to properly price the security. Well, the, so, and, and if a case gets resolved, the price usually goes up. Mm -hmm. So you're not really taking out of your own pocket or you're really not hurting yourself. Well, this, this is the question. In the LIBOR, RBS settled a couple of weeks ago, and I, I wrote a piece for uh, a, a European, uh, the, the London lawyer. And the question is, whatever RBS paid, was it, was it enough? And my position is, I, didn't, I sort of hinted that I didn't think so. They were effectively paying for the license to break the law. But what you hope in these cases is, is that the, regu the resolution is transparent and the wrongdoing is transparent and there's a record out there. And that record then drives the regulators to do something. It drives the press to do oversight and it puts the investment community on notice that you know, the next time they buy the horse, they should check the teeth. Right? And so I think at the end of the day, you're never going to have a, a, a penalty that really is, unless you start imposing liability on the directors, right? the, which I think is a whole other area of endeavor. Uh, but, it, but it's the transparency. And Justice Brandeis, many years ago in the United States, famous Supreme Court Justice said, said, sunshine is the greatest disinfectant. And that's the, that's the most important thing you hope for. But I mean, with RBS, it seems to be very ironic if they're being subject to a large fine currently 82% owned by the British government, which means the taxpayer. So who's... Well, the, 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 the logic of the RBS settlement was is that they were going to engage in clawbacks from the wrongdoers. But the question is, how much were the bonuses and how much is being clawed back, right? <laughs> and the article I did, I think, which we attached in the papers here, said this is a real question of transparency. What you really need to ask is, how much, you know, here are the 15 or 30 or 100 people you're going to claw back from. How much should they get? Right? And how much are you, you going to ask back for them? And was it, you know, are, they, are they really being penalized? If somebody gets $30 million bonus and they're giving back $2 million, sure, it's a clawback, but you know, 
heck, I'd rather, you know, it, right, makes it, it's, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the, it's part of the, it's the rules of the sport. Yes. So, Ken Lian, you, you ran your insurance company very successfully in Singapore for 30 years. <coughs> so, that's a tremendous legacy to leave to one's successors. So, they must be very happy that, of your previous stewardship, we imagine. I hope so. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, next uh, interesting one here. Um, in today's news, uh, this is to do with the Korean market. In the Korean market, large family-owned uh, conglomerates, the Chebol, uh, have been selling large blocks of uh, shares uh, at major discounts to the public price. Uh, for example, Hanwha Chemical here uh, is, is mentioned. Uh, is there any recourse here by the small the individual um, shareholder with this sort of perhaps not immoral, or maybe it is immoral, not illegal but uh, unethical behavior? Well, what, so I don't understand. What's unethical about selling something below price? Uh, maybe, am I reading the question correctly? <laughs> so, so shares are being sold below market price? Yeah, selling large trades of shares, uh, major discounts to the public price. Uh -huh. I, I, uh, sell, to no problem? sell to who? Sell to the market, okay. to anybody? Yeah. I mean, usually don't, don't actually say I haven't read the article here. Well, usually, if you something. sell something below market price, that means you don't believe in a sustained market price yourself. You're selling it, uh, and you're trying to get something before it might fall. There mm -hmm. might be a sort of insider information that they know that other people don't know, and that could result in something later. Uh, not so much against the people who are selling below market price, but maybe against the company itself for not disclosing something uh, that they should have disclosed, um, which would have resulted in a lower market price already. Okay, perhaps that's the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, here's another one here, uh, which says, while I understand the need to protect investors, there is little mention of the accountability slash responsibility of such individuals. Such imbalance is not appropriate either. And how do we educate investors of their responsibility? So education, perhaps that's a question for institutional investor, but uh, a, education organization. No, but, there's a, but there's a big difference between providing an insurance for investments and providing recourse for an investment which was made on the wrong basis. <laughs> huh? That's a big difference, and I think the imbalance is, is not there unless people think they're entitled to recovery any time the stock drops or the investment goes bad, because it's not always the result of somebody else's fault if you buy a car that's a lemon. Well, well that's a bad example. If you, if you make a bad choice in an investment, it's really not somebody else's fault all the time. So it has to be in the minds of the people. You have to change the minds of the people going away from this entitlement thinking that investments can only go up. Yeah. Well, this, this, this is quite, Anthony uh, raised this terrific point, this whole caveat emptor point, which is buyer beware. And the question is, does the buyer have the ability to beware? And here's where I raise this concern. Right. Walmart, for example, used to manufacture in the United States, and that was their big, big selling point. Now they bring in the suppliers and they say, give us the lowest price, and if you don't give us the lowest price, we'll get somebody else. The suppliers then come to China and they, they press down on the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And you have shirts like this and buttons are being dyed in somebody's house in the middle of nowhere and maybe they're using lead paint, okay? And if you go on Walmart's website, it says, we monitor our supply chain. We ensure that everybody complies with the law. Buyer beware. Buyer did exactly what he's supposed to do. He bought the security, he bought Walmart stock, he believed the representation on their website, but in fact, the representation's false, and now, let's say, in theory, and this actually happened with Mattel and the lead paint and the toys, let's say it's Mattel, Mattel made the same representations, toys made in China, lead paint, stock price problem because there's a recall, right? Buyer beware. He did exactly, he or she did exactly what they were supposed to do, but the buyer doesn't have the ability to look in the horse's mouth, which is analyze these complex supply chains. It's, that's why, that's why it's, the buyer beware logic doesn't work necessarily in, in the securities market. But, but don't believe him, he's never bought a Walmart shirt. Okay. <laughs> no, I did, actually, no, it's true, I did. But they're actually, you know, they're okay. Was Not that a, wal one. a walnut shirt or a walnut, or a Walmart share? I, 
bought the Chairs shirt. and shirts. I, I bought the shirt before the chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, here's one here. Doctors, lawyers, and accountants need to be very well trained and licensed. Why not financial advisors? I guess this is referring to compulsory um, licensing, and then that means that there has to be judicial reviews or review panels or professional conduct. Or <coughs> there's no point in having compulsory licensing if you can't lose the license for the wrong behavior. Kilian? Uh, well, if you look at the profession, there's certain uh, uh, proper uh, Bible to guide what they should do, and we should need that also for financial advisors. Right now, they can just uh, create their own, their own Bible yeah. uh, about what is good and what is bad. So I think that, that is very important. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had a discussion with Paul Smith last night, and I say, well, it's all nice that you certify the CFAs, but what happens then? You use CFA, and for the next 20 years, you don't have to go through requalifications again. So the law and everything else around you is changing, and you keep your driver's license, and you don't know anything that's changed. You don't know the stop doesn't mean stop anymore, and red doesn't mean red anymore. And you don't know about the changing rules in the whole uh, environment as how to have to advertise products, how, what you have to uh, disclose to people. None of that is compulsory anymore once you've obtained your license, so, uh, or uh, obtained your qualification. Mm -hmm. So maybe one step before this regulatory licensing is just having certain uh, more standards in maintaining licensing, uh, in continued education and mandatory continued education of some core changes that happen every year. And if you don't do this, you lose your, your yeah. qualification. So continuous professional development. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, as, as a lawyer, I'm licensed. And um, any time a client would push me to do something that's improper, uh, I panic because my license is my way to make a living and be up here and so forth. And, um, and so when you start imposing individual responsibility with the threat of taking away a property right, I think it's critically important. So I'm all in favor of that. It's not a perfect solution in the legal world, but I will tell you that lawyers are very scared about the United States being disbarred. And that's why, that's why we try to stay within the four corners of the law. Yeah. Anthony Neal, last yes. word. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah, Anthony Neal shared with us um, what's happening in Australia and New Zealand <laughs> about the need to pay for uh, financial advice. I spent um, more than five years in a financial um, um, services uh, um, firm in New Zealand, and in those days, of course, um, you anybody can be a financial advisor, right? There's no no training, no licensing, that sort of thing. So when the New Zealand government decided after the crash that there was a need to have um, CPD requirements, licensing, and getting people to pay for proper uh, financial advice, the resistance was extremely huge, really, really difficult. Because in a small nation of um, 4 million people, there's more sheep than people around there. Um, it, it, it was really, really difficult. You see, it's, it's, it's a mind shift because people pay for lawyers, People pay for doctors, but why not financial advice? You know, because it's, it's got a huge impact on your life savings and things like that. Right. So it's a whole mindset shift about whether you want to get legal advice um, and you know, financial advice and the different sort of professional advice from qualified um, um, advisors. Mm -hmm. So still Kevin mTOR, but there's a professional obligation to do properly, you know, a proper job of giving proper advice and hopefully less of the mis-selling. That sounds good. I'm tempted to go to my lawyer for financial advice because he'll lose his license if he does the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a very interesting, very wide-ranging discussion and we have a vote of thanks to give to the panel. So please join me in thanking Suchem and Ruben and Alex and Kinlian. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.